Welcome to Lockbox, a podcast providing real estate professionals with action items for success. My name is Jeffrey Broger, and I'm going to be your host. I'm the founder of two real estate marketing and tech companies, Steezy.Digital and RealNurture.io. In this podcast, you'll learn from top 1% real estate and mortgage brokers the exact secrets to their success. Welcome to Lockbox. Welcome to Lockbox. My name is Jeffrey Broger, and I am here today with Aaron Bates and Rebecca Cohen. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Why don't you kick it off? Tell our listeners who you are, where you're from. Well, we are real estate agents. We, we own a, our own brokerage, uh, Mr. Holmes Realty. We're located here on Long Island, New York. Awesome. And obviously, Rebecca, go for it. Same story or a different story? To add something or not, I didn't even know what to add. <laughs> Aaron and I, um, Aaron's been in real estate for more than 10 years. We partnered up five years ago and then just this year became owners of Mr. Holmes. Okay. Awesome. So you uh, knew each other from the industry, partnered up five years ago. Now you have Mr. Holmes. And what got you into the real estate industry? Usually I'm interviewing one guest. So this is going to be awesome because each question can be answered by either of you. Um, yeah. But what got you into the real estate industry? I guess, uh, Rebecca, you can go first. Oh, Aaron's story is so much better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a teacher. So I was a teacher And I just didn't want to go back to the classroom and be kind of living on somebody else's rules and timeline and, you know, like punching the clock kind of thing. So I decided to get into real estate so that I could have freedom. And that brought me where I am now. How much do you have freedom? (laughs) Have you achieved freedom? (laughs) Some ways, yes. But I think we all get caught up in that. Um. Like you say, oh, I want to work my own hours is the most. And then you work all the time. And I always say, well, (laughs) if you don't control it, those hours are all of them. It's all of the hours. So um, I've been in that trap, but, you know, trying to find the balance always getting better. Yeah, for sure. And hopefully today we can learn some of the tips and tricks that you've, you know, identified and put into place in your own life to help overcome that. Because I think all real estate professionals suffer from that. And that's kind of the purpose of this podcast is to distill down those, distill down those actions and habits that have helped you have better work-life balance, more success. So I'm excited to dive into that topic with you. Aaron, you want to talk to the audience here about how you got into real estate? So uh, mine was a phone call. I had a random phone call from an old friend of mine who uh, kind of called me up and said, hey, you know, I know we haven't talked in a while. But what are you doing with your life? And I was kind of caught up. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, what am I doing in my life? Right. You know? and I, so I went through it. At that time, I was in transition. I, I worked for an alarm company a ni- doing a nine to five for a very long time. <clears throat> they were around for 35 years. The company shut down. I was one of the last three employees. Would have probably continued working with one of the owners on a different business and adventure, but I, I kind of decided that I I didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't want to work for somebody else again. It just took me a while to figure that out. So my, along the way, I was kind of just doing everything possible to to survive. I bartended for almost twelve or fourteen years, which kind of evolves into a, a lot of what our current customers and clients are, mm-hmm. old bar pa- pa- patrons. But yeah, so it was a phone call asking me, what am I doing with my life? And ultimately it came came out to, you know, you've always been a hustler. I really think you'd be good at this. Go get your real estate license. So I looked into it and we did a, it was 75 hours, two exams, I banged out the course in two and a half weeks because I had the time. And then I, I took the exam and the rest is really kind of history, jumped right into the the distressed REO, um, real estate owned bank, bank owned properties into that business. Happ- so happily- timeline, is, is this like, like 2010, 11 time? So yes, it would be. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, right after the crash, right when it was probably the, the hottest it could possibly be. I actually was about two years behind it where like, I know the company that I, that I worked for at the time, they were probably getting anywhere from a thousand plus assets and um, it was probably about a little bit, half of that when I first started, which was still a lot. So I learned a lot through that. And ultimately, it, it evolved to more traditional business, which is working with uh, normal people and not just banks. 
So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. And here you are today, teamed up with Rebecca and crushing it out there in New York. So I'm curious to give my listeners context of where you're at today, and you can kind of give advice for, you know, I have some follow-up questions. What was your transaction volume last year? Last year, our volume was, we closed 22 million in sales last year. Okay, awesome. And my follow-up question is, you know, what advice would you give to the broker who maybe they're not even a broker or team lead yet, but they're a high performing individual agent and they're thinking about, you know, breaking out and increasing their transaction volume from maybe five or 10 million to where it's comfortable, but they really want more to that 15, 20 million. Like what, what are some things that they can do? Um, it could be advice that they should ignore, or it could be, you know, some tips and tricks to help get them to that next level. I think it's all about systems, implementing mm-hmm. systems into your business. Um, we actually just did a class yesterday on running your business like a business. Um, so instead of like flying by the seat of your pants and just going wherever, whenever, you know, managing your time and managing your business, um, mm-hmm. implementing systems for as many things that you do as possible. Okay. And now you've, you've mentioned time twice now. In the beginning, when you talked about, you know, work-life balance and and not working all the time just because now you're a real estate agent, you set your own hours, right? So, do you have a specific system of planning, um, any type of like weekly ritual, daily ritual? You know, what does that look like for you? How are you time blocking and making sure that you're focusing on income producing activities and also having time to have a life? It's still it's, a work in progress. It's a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, it is always a work in progress. <laughs> but about just a little bit less than a year ago, I started taking one day off every week and I've been sticking with it other than like twice. Like really, um, really a day off, like for real. An actual day off where I wake up when I want, I do what I want. It's like totally dedicated family time. That's it. And I implemented that right in the middle of what ended up being our biggest year ever. There you go. During the craziest time. Yeah. And during the craziest time. Yeah. I think it was kind of like a lesson learned during quarantine was like, I have all of this time sitting at home and how easy it is to just let work take over your life, no matter where you are. And I was getting burnt out, you know? So I was like, this is it. I'm just going to take a day off and that's it. Like, that's what we're doing. And so that's what I've been doing for almost a year now. It's so important. It's so important. Rest and recovery. It's highly underrated. Darren Hardy talks about increasing productivity through taking more vacation. <laughs> like, you know, don't work through your vacation or like if you're an employee, don't cash it out at the end of the year and just keep working. Like take that time, like take a day off a week, take two days off a week, really take a week off and go to the Bahamas, do whatever you want to do to recharge, to come back and be the best version of yourself Monday through Friday for the remainder of the year that you need to be to hit those goals. So I think that's a huge concept to be able to truly shut it off for a day because Mm -hmm. it's so hard. I mean, it used to be that you left the office and the phone would ring at the office. You'd go check, you know, check the voicemails in the morning. Now it's in our pocket all the time. It's just never, it's not, never not with us. It's on our watch. It's everywhere. So that takes a lot of discipline and you are a testament that it increased your productivity, which is great. Aaron, do you have any tips for the up and coming five, $10 million agent that wants to double his transaction volume in the next 12 months? Consistency, I think is, is probably one of the biggest things. Uh, we're all, you know, we live in an instant gratification world. So it's very easy to, you know, make one call and then you don't hear from that person or you didn't connect with them right away and then give up on it, you know, or even call them, call or contact them several times and then already give up on it. You already did the heavy lifting and something I say it very often. So it's the follow-up, the, the money's in the follow-up, you know, yep. that's also building relationships too, which we we've 100% built a relationship business. We decided a long time ago that that was really the only way to go. Transactional doesn't get you anywhere. And, you know, we have, you know, we have hundreds of clients that we would probably go out and have a beer with. You know, because we genuinely really like them. And I, I would imagine it's it's both ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we just planned, uh, we're planning 
our fourth yearly event. So we do an event every year and this year will be our fourth one. But we just sent out, we invited 304 past clients to this event. 404. 404. So 404 people, (laughs) um, which is huge. And the great thing about it is that most of them are people that we've still been in contact with throughout the year all the time, whether it's... um, we talk to them on social media or we're texting or we're calling or we're seeing them somewhere. The I think the number of real relationships that we have with people is a lot. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that number one, this is such a relationship business and your transactions will continue to multiply. Like Aaron said, you already did the hard work, you know, getting that either that first number, that first lead, that first phone call, that first client, but then when you really lean into that relationship, now they have friends and family that they refer you to because you did great and they love you. And in five years, when they sell the house that they bought with you, you're the first person they call because you're still top of mind. And then it just keeps evolving from there, right? And lifetime value is such an important concept to understand in any business, especially real estate, because multiple transactions should be generated from that one transaction in referrals and repeat business. And Mm -hmm. it's so important to lean into those relationships. So it's great that you are doing the client appreciation parties. And now, you know, those are coming back now that things are kind of lit. Uh, The COVID restrictions are being lifted, right? And people are comfortable being in person because there's nothing like just having an in-person party and, you know, getting everyone together. One thing that Aaron said was consistency. I really appreciate that. One of the hashtags for this show when we post on social media, in fact, is consistency is sexy. And the reason for that is because the whole concept behind this podcast is I want to distill down the action items for success that agents can focus on consistently over time that will then create momentum and create a compound effect. Because mm-hmm. that's what it's all about. When I've had success in, in direct sales, it w- wasn't when I made one phone call and did one appointment a week. It was when, regardless of my results, I made 40 phone calls a day, every single day, because I was committed to that number and I focus on the actions. And then all of a sudden I look up at the end of the year and I made more money than I ever did in my life. But I wasn't focused on anything other than that one key productivity indicator, right? So that's why I'm so fascinated with like, okay, but what's your planning regimen? Like what's your, you know, what's the one thing? So with that in mind, what is the single most important action that you take on a daily basis that attributes most to your success? If one of you are ready, you can go, you know, uh, it's, it really comes down to like, what's the most important thing you do every day? Wake up. (laughs) Get up, do it. (laughs) No. The most important? Yeah. The most important action you take. Uh, Mindset. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Not exactly. an action, I don't think, but I think that your mindset is so, so, so important. It's you how can you get how you approach your day. You could get thrown off by a single phone call. Yep. Um, at any given time, it doesn't have to be a phone call. It could be an email. It could be a text message. There's just too many curveballs getting thrown your way, and it totally could set you off your game. And um, that's why mindset's so important. Because even even so, like say you have a you have 10 phone calls you have to make that's on a list, you'll hold off for making that phone call. So important. Yep. So I, I think uh, more than action, I think that, that that routine or that idea of getting your mind right in the morning is more important than, than anything, any other action you could take throughout the day. I agree. And do you mind if I dive a little bit deeper on that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So to now translate that to something that our listeners can, can really take and, and implement into their daily life. What does that look like for you? For me, the action that I take in order to do that is to wake up early, work out, nourish my, my body, my physical body with good nutrients, shake all the stuff, the green drink, right? After the workout. So I'm like super awake. My body has now been nourished. And during that time that I'm doing the shake and doing all the stuff, I listen to motivational or educational audio. Tony Robbins calls it net time, no extra time, right? When your hands are busy, but your mind is free, don't waste that time. So 
that's my routine and how I, how I really ramp up the day to be a success from the start to win before I even begin is to really just every single morning do that routine. So do you have a routine similar to that? And I, I really want to hear from you, like, what does that look like for you on a daily basis? Because it's very difficult to train our mindset and to not just kind of rest on our laurels and be lazy. Like it's, it's easy to be lazy, right? And to, to not do these things. But what's easy not to do is, is also relatively easy to do if you just continue focusing on it as a consistent action and commit to it. So do it's you have creating, a morning routine? It's really kind of creating a habit. So um, mm-hmm. I like to say I don't have the best routine, but I, I know that when I do, when I go work out, I eat the way I need to eat right after. I am listening to podcasts very often or maybe I'm watching something if I'm on a treadmill and then days that I just want to jam, I'm, I'm listening to something to get me hyped up for the day. And then I'll, I'll even bring that into the shower sometimes too. And then I'm at that point, I'm probably just jamming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. So you make sure that you're fired up. That sounds like you pay attention to your, your physiology and your energy level. Like, cause I'm the same way. Music lights me up. So if I'm kind of feeling flat or gosh, I'm just, I don't even want to do this today. Or I'm unmotiva- unmotivated. I'll put my earbuds in and put on one of my favorite songs or a playlist and just get fired up. So that, that resonates with me too. Well, Rebecca, do you have, you know, any answer to that? You've had some time to think uh, a single most important action you take on a daily basis that attributes most to your success. I think that it is really, it's just, it's having a routine um, or having like a, having your day set out, you know, for me, every day does not look the same, but I know what every day is going to look like. Basically when I wake up in the morning, I know how the entire day is going to go between being a mom and um, owning a business and trying to take care of myself. Um, so I definitely have a routine set for every day. And then I would, I think that the biggest shift for me came when I decided that I'm going to be all in at one thing at a time, um, instead of like helping the kids with homework and trying to work at the same time, mm. just help with the homework. You know what I mean? Um, you know, instead of just trying to do to, to be too many things all at once, when I committed to being one thing at a time, that shifted my mindset in my approach to everything all day long. So what I heard from that is that multitasking is a myth. It is for me. I cannot do it. <laughs> it is, it is for me too. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, women are better at multitasking <laughs> than men. But for me, it's a total myth. And I take pride in single tasking, in having something on my calendar and blocking distractions and being able to focus. I mean, we live in a world nowadays where focus is more valuable than knowledge. Like if you have all the knowledge in the world and you can't take focused action and actually make a result from it, it doesn't mean anything, Mm -hmm. right? And I I feel like so much of that goes into the overwhelm of like becoming a new agent, getting all this information, getting all this advice you have. Now you have this knowledge, but it's like, okay, at what point are you blocking off the time to do outreach to your past clients? Mm -hmm. And then sitting down and just doing it. Not like checking the fridge or like taking the dog on a walk or like, hey, this is a great time to now go clean up the closet. Like it, all the distractions in the world come up when you have to sit down and do a thing that you don't want to do, right? But to sit down and do it and single task on it is so critical. And that's a really good tip. Like that'll take you so far in my own experience and in the experience of all of the personal development people that I've studied, focus and single tasking is huge. So I have more analogies and more stories to back it up and support it, but uh, we can move on. So I'm curious about your percentage of referral business to new business that might come from uh, some kind of lead generation, right? So do you kind of have that percentage or or a feel for like what your referral business to new business is? 90-10 or 95-5 probably. Yeah. It's like 90% referrals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Repeat referral. And so you mentioned having the once a year party. Mm -hmm. What other systems do you have in place to increase the amount of referrals that you receive? I just called somebody for their birthday. He he remembers everybody's birthday. Do you have it in your phone? Is it a reminder? Most of the time it's, it's in a a reminder in my phone. Like I, 
like I, if you gave me your birthday right now, I'd go in my phone book. So like, I usually take notes of it. You add I mean, it to the contact. You have the, yeah. Someone will be spitting it out and I'll take, take note of that or anniversaries and do the same thing. So then I'm taking note of it to write it, write it in my phone book later on. I'm assuming I have their phone number. If they're client, then right. Sign their phone number. So I do that because granted we have, you know, platforms like Facebook where you're, birthday might be on there but not everybody has that platform that has it they're not on facebook so or it could be a, it could be our client that's 70 years old or something and they're not on any social media so that's one of the things that that we try to stay in front of people you know even though and, even if like we log into facebook and we know it's somebody's birthday today we don't just like say happy birthday on facebook like we'll call them yeah it's like you pick we pick up the phone and call them and it's like happy birthday what are you doing today and then following up like that. Nice. So and it gives you that excuse to, to reach out. Right. Yeah. And I think it's so easy just to like send somebody a text that says happy birthday or write it on Facebook or something. But how many people are actually even calling anybody to wish them a happy birthday anymore? You know, even your family members don't even call you. They just leave it on Facebook anymore. Right. Right. Definitely so, stands out. Yeah. I think it's more meaningful to get that phone call. We also, um, we send out an anniversary card to everybody every year on their home anniversary. Um, so that's another way that we stay in touch with them. What else do we do? Weddings, babies. Yeah. There's so many, so many touch points throughout a year. I mean, a lot of our clients, you know, have bought their home, then got married two months later and then had a baby within six months. Well, not, <laughs> didn't have a baby in six months, but <laughs> they got impregnated in six months. <laughs> right. <laughs> Most of our clients, it's like a lot of a huge part of our clientele is like millennials, you know, people in their 20s and 30s and they're, you know, they're buying the house and then they're getting married and then they're having a baby and then they're having another baby. So I think that what's happened is as we've become their realtor, we've just sort of celebrated all of their life events with them. Right. You know? Yeah, that makes total sense. Like we've gotten to know them during these events. So it's very easily been that we've become a part of them. You know, I was just thinking today. So uh, when I went to the house earlier, uh-huh. and I don't know if you know this, but she has two grandbabies coming. Okay. Did you know about that? No. All right. So oftentimes we know about people being pregnant before the anyway, world knows. All the time. Like <laughs> it's because like that, you know, we, we sit down with a buyer, they're looking to buy a house. And then, you know, one of the questions we always ask, why are we buying this? Well, nobody knows, but I'm pregnant. Right. And then, all the time and then, or we're out really, looking at houses and they're like oh this would be great for the babies or, or they just like they're like you know it's like <sighs> dj like, scratch oops. like what like, they say it and then they're like oops. they're they like uh, yeah and, you know so we end up just sort of like knowing that everybody's having a baby before they're actually even telling a soul that they're having a baby so it's mm-hmm. great or then all of a sudden like they're they might buy a house they might buy a house they might buy a house and then all of a sudden they're like hey we need to buy a house now now we're ready. The time is right now. Right. And it's the baby factor. It's always a baby. <laughs> the life event, the baby factor. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So that also builds rapport, right? When they let that sneak and they're like, oh, but you know, no one knows. We'll keep it a secret. And <laughs> it's like, it's such a bonding moment. So that's, that's awesome. And it seems like you've mentioned a broad range of clientele. You know, Aaron mentioned the 70 year old client that's not on Facebook. And then, you know, I think it was Rebecca or Aaron mentioned like millennials, right? Working with a lot of millennials, right? So what's been your number one most profitable lead generation source? I know you said that like most business is repeat referral, and it seems like you started from your sphere, but there's still that, you know, that 10% or, you know, the millennials that are all over social media and stuff. So, so what's been like the number one most profitable lead gen source for you other than referrals? We have We've, been, we haven't done lead gen in a couple of years. Our first year together, we did lead gen. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work. No, it worked. It was oh. great. No, we did paid lead gen. We did Zillow. Um, and we got a ton of business off of it. It was great. We probably could have. We probably could have done four times the amount of business we actually did from it. If we had the systems in place. If we had the systems in place. <laughs> but we didn't have systems. We were just going, you know, running, running, oh, running. Phone? Yep. Okay. You want to see one, two, three main yeah. street. All right. Mm-hmm. Click. We're all set. Mm-hmm. 
Um, we stopped doing Zillow when they started changing things. And we, I think it was like, if you couldn't do the live transfer, then you, then they just went to the next person. So we stopped it then because it just wasn't working the same way for us anymore without having somebody always available to do a live transfer. Um, so we, we stopped doing that. And then I think we decreased a little bit. I think we did decrease some in volume. I think we decreased in volume, but still increased in commission and we eliminated the paid advertising. So I think overall, we still ended up bringing in more money that year that we dropped it. Yeah. Cause we weren't paying for anything. Yeah. However, right. it ended up, we still, we came out ahead, even though we dropped it on um, net and building. Yes. Yeah. Then we've just been building on referral since then. Cool. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And I'm curious, you know, leveraging your referrals in your sphere, if once you get the listing, you're leveraging any type of digital marketing to generate new leads from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually, the home that we listed on Monday came from across the way. Across the street from a house we recently sold. They saw they saw what happened when when the house was getting shown and everything else. Obviously, knew the house on the market, saw it get sold. We did send out a postcard. We got contacted from the postcard, even though the, the seller client who then moved, obviously they moved, uh, <laughs> did speak to the current client that we have, current homeowner. Mm-hmm. So they weren't neighborly friends is what you're saying, right? They were, but I don't think they were. They were neighbors, but not friends. They were yeah, they're friendly more like, neighbors, not friends. Though. Yeah, they, they would speak. Got it. So. Mm-hmm. So we got don't know it. the exact referral from that, but they did mention that they got our postcard and it was were, they were happy that they that we sent it out. Mm-hmm. And then we sat down with them. You know, they knew basically everything we did. And then I also gave them all the numbers. Like, this is how many times we showed it. This is how many offers we had. Yeah, that's really it. Whole yeah, process you soon. told them the story. Yeah. Told them the story of how, what happened with the house. But I think that if we really talk about what we do digitally, most of all, I think that it's been our social media that has been, you know, besides just our sphere or past clients or whatever, I think it's just been what we do on social media that's brought more people in and kept okay. us in front of people more than anything. So, yeah. Why don't we dive into that a little bit? What, what are you doing on social media? Well, I wouldn't say that we're pioneers, but like when no. people... <laughs> <laughs> when we did, we did team up. So January of whatever year that was, when 2017. Was, so 2017, we had a conference. We used to be with Century 21. Uh, we had a conference in Vegas um, that both of us attended. Um, when Once we got there, and this is before we were a team, she was just getting started. I've been in the, in the business for five, six years at that point. But I knew that I needed to get to the next level anyways. And where I was, I was kind of just stale. And we went to the conference and we realized that a lot of the classes that we we had the same kind of classes we want to go to so a lot of it was video social media everything else is geared towards that you know they've been saying it for 10 years to to get on video but you know within the last five years they've been pushing even more and and so at that time we that's what we did we engulfed ourselves in everything social media and video and stuff and when we got back from the convention we said all right here's here's the game plan we're going to start doing videos. They're going to be educational, you know, a little bit of fun, like very short. Um, we were doing car videos. So it was easy. We could get behind the wheel, throw a camera on, on the dashboard and then talk about it, have a top. And the topic went anywhere from, uh, you know, 10 steps to buying a house or getting ready to buy a house to why you should have a real estate attorney to how to buy and sell at the same time, how Zillow is wrong 45% of the time. Like, like, it was, it was a mix between everything, but we were religiously doing a video once or twice a week and then post snap. And we said, well, here's a nine month plan. Let's figure it out. I kept on posting, getting more, more feedback from it. People are starting to notice I'm out of, I'm in other States and people are coming up to me saying they saw, saw it. And this is before, like really now it, it seems like everybody's doing video. Everybody's doing social media, whether they're doing it good or bad is a different story. Mm -hmm. And um, it was right around like the seventh month mark where you could actually see a little bit of the return because just because we were getting busier. It's really hard to ever come up with a number of what directly coming from social media because it's like the the bus stop bench. Like you don't know if a thousand people see that a day. You don't know if they're actually coming from that unless they told you 
that they came from the park bench or the, the bus stop bench. Right. You know, so it's the same idea unless they actually reached out to you on a social platform and said, hey, we would love to work with you. Uh, we want to sell our home, which doesn't happen every single day, but it does happen. So we spent the time doing that. Of course, we got busier and then kind of scaled back a little bit unintentionally. It's just we got too busy to do it and didn't allocate the time to do the videos and do the, the social media stuff to continue what we're continue off our success. Right. Mm -hmm. So that strategy of two, three videos a week consistently for, you know, nine months seemed to be groundbreaking time for you and your brokerage because you were kind of ahead of the curve on it. And it got you to the point where you were so busy, you had so much social proof and so much education that, you know, people were, that you didn't know from other states kind of already knew your name and you, you had that little bit of a celebrity effect like, oh, hey, you're Aaron, right? And <laughs> they know you before you've ever talked to them. Yeah. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> yeah, she, she can attest to this too. She had somebody that I, that I know, but like came up to her in a bar and act as if she knew her she forever. She came up to me. Like, she hugged you. <laughs> like body hugged me and she was like, it's so great to see you again. And I was like, I have 100% never met that woman in my whole life. Right. It's like, are you sure? Maybe here, maybe here. I'm like, never, absolutely never. And then she kept talking about the videos and the videos and the videos and the videos. And she thought that she had actually, she had seen so many videos of me that she thought like we knew each other at that point. Right. No, each other at all. But it really does go to show the power of just using video at all, whether it's a whole post or if it's like stories or going live, all kinds of different strategies of using video um, and the power of it to just connect with your audience because more people connect with you from a video than anything else, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such a trust builder. Is it? And at the end of the day, especially from cold social traffic, out there just browsing that have no idea who you are trust is the number one thing that we want to create between you know ourselves as the real estate professional and them mm -hmm. and let them know that we have their best interest in mind not ours right and having the ability to post a video and have it syndicated to thousands and millions of personal devices that people are watching every single day i mean for free mm -hmm. it's an incredible opportunity and you know you took advantage of it and we're you know, on the on the front end of it and receive benefits. So that's great. Glad to hear that you're leveraging video. And uh, you know, nowadays, yes, more agents are doing it, but kind of like Aaron said, whether they're doing it right is kind of the question. Like, you know, there are systems and processes and scripts that work, and it's more of like a framework. And then there are ones that don't. When it's just like, hey, look at me, here's my nice car, right? <laughs> in front of this mansion, like that stuff, it it's um, attractive for a certain kind of market, but not necessarily to let the real estate client know that you have their best interest in mind. So it sounds like you definitely did it right. And that's great to hear. Yeah. I think that the, what I think that the key to video, no matter what, is just to be real and to be yourself. I don't know. Like I used to, like I trip and fall all the time. So whether it's videos making fun of myself for tripping and falling while showing houses, beautiful homes to people or, you know, but it's just like showing the real you. Um, or Aaron did this video one time in a house and he was sweating through all of his clothes. It was horrible, but it was oh, the real yes. him. It was, it was him. Like that was the real the, thing. It was the real really him, hot. The guy that just sweats. But <laughs> it was a hot day, but you know, yeah. I think like the key, 95 degrees. Yeah. The key to, to me, the key to video is to really actually be yourself. So it doesn't necessarily matter if it's scripted or professional or whatever it is, but that the message, the message of the video is clear and that you're real, that you, you know, that the person that they get on video is the same person that shows up to their house. You know, it's the same yes. both ways. That's what I think is the most important thing about it. You know, that it's, it's authentic. It is. I've, studied influencers and how they grow their accounts because being in the digital marketing world i've helped real estate professionals you know this is kind of like back in the day when the instagram algorithm was completely different from what it is now but i'd help them go from 200 followers to 15,000 followers in a, in a span of like six months and 
through that learning process of learning how to take someone from obscurity and then make them kind of like a local celebrity, I studied a lot of influencers. And I noticed that as I was watching their older videos, they felt more nervous, more scripted, and there was a disconnect emotionally when I was watching it. And then you go fast forward to when they have a million followers or even, you know, a hundred thousand and they're completely themselves, just like not even like clean shaven or whatever, just showing up and just shooting the one take and their fans are eating it up because it's authentic. Yeah. So there is so much value in authenticity and Gary V talks about documenting. You don't have to create content, just document what you're doing. If you're the real deal, then you'll have tons of things to document every single day that are fascinating to people that are outside your industry. And to support that, when you're working on something for an extended period of time, like multiple years, you start to take for granted all the fascinations and the breakthroughs that you made when you were first introduced to it. It's Mm -hmm. called the law of familiarity. Mm -hmm. So you're so familiar with this that, you know, going to a lockbox and looking at, you know, the cracks of the ceiling, what that means and all this stuff. It just is second nature to you. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating to someone who essentially is kind of like watching their own little HGTV and they're watching you go live through a, a listing. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the other thing as we're kind of giving advice and topics and encouragement to the listeners to shoot video. It's like, it doesn't have to be high production value, scripted, groundbreaking. It can be you walking through a house being authentic and showing what you're doing every single day. And that in and of itself will attract viewers, followers, and then customers. Yeah. And there's so many things that just uh, get thrown at you every day or you encounter, like the squatters in the house. That you- <laughs> it's like reality TV. Yeah. They're like <laughs> having to get into a house, crawl in a, in a window. You want to make sure that your your people can travel there and not get into the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, many, so many crazy things. I had I had one time. Um, I assumed, and I'll never assume again, uh, because I I picked up a key from a, a real estate office and went to the house because I picked up the key. I thought that nobody was home. Sure shit, I opened up the door and didn't lock, and I have a guy flying at me, a naked girl going across the living room. And uh, the guy's naked too. And my two clients are already at the road because they ran away so quick. And I was like, whoa, 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 everything's all right. They didn't tell me. <laughs> they go, and the guy calmed down. They got put on. They apologized. But like I, from that point on, I'll never assume that a house is actually vacant if someone's giving me the key. Because they actually, they, they said, I said, well, well, I'm good to go, right? And they're like, yeah. So I assume by saying that, I have to worry about anybody in the house. Right. And sure enough, they were. (laughs) Wow. What what an awesome story. (laughs) Well, it's been a valuable conversation. How can listeners contact you? You can get a hold of uh, both of us on our social media, which would be at Aaron Bates Real Estate on every platform. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitter. I didn't even know we had that account. Pinterest. Oh, we got a Pinterest account too. We're everywhere. I think I even made a TikTok. Oh, yeah, we're on TikTok too. (laughs) But but we're not very good at TikTok yet. We're not really there. (laughs) Yeah. TikTok's coming. Have you done a lot on Pinterest, Rebecca? Um, I do a little on Pinterest, not a lot. Um, So I'll post some of our, I post our videos on Pinterest and I'll post content on Pinterest, like blog posts, and I'll share them to Pinterest. Yeah. That's an untapped area. I mean, Behind Google and YouTube, Pinterest is a huge search engine, essentially, and it really resonates with the female population. I mean, I have three sisters. They all love and have Pinterest and have all these boards and have all this stuff. And and, uh, there's a lot of fascinating possibilities with Pinterest. As a social media marketing agency, I haven't really focused on that nearly as much as the Facebook, Instagram, like the big ones. Mm -hmm. But gosh, I just feel like there's so much potential there to have long-term benefits from single posts that are really valuable that are on all these other people's boards that they've pinned and they just like keep referring back to and sharing and all this it's like you do a post once and it doesn't just get buried in a feed people can pin it and it's there forever on their board so there's a lot of value there i was just curious if you had really like leaned into it and had some nuggets but 
leaned into it at all. I just simply have created boards and been posting, but I haven't like taken it to the next level and promoting right. interest or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I, when I'm creating and posting content, I will put it there also. Sure. Awesome. Well, the Aaron Bates real estate team, really appreciate you offering some value, especially all of the the video nuggets that you offered. I mean, it's such a hot topic still. I mean, still you go to conferences, you hear got to be on video. And Aaron mentioned they've been saying this for 10 years. Now it's finally catching on. But that's awesome that you dove in. You kind of found your groove with scripting out content, but then being really authentic about it. Mm-hmm. And that breakdown of having the separation between strategy and execution is really important. Like you sat down and you're like, okay, we're gonna do this for nine months. And here are the topics so that you you had the ideas in place and organized so that then once you're in execution, you just refer back to the plan. Mm-hmm. So, so different from shooting from the hip and it, oh, it's noon. I got a post. What am I going to post? Right. <laughs> so yeah, different. Okay. Too, like we were able to kind of just jump behind the wheel like oh here's a topic we give it to each other in the morning and then go and go and film it but i think what's important for everybody to understand that your imperfect is perfection i said that yep. wrong. your imperfections are your perfection <laughs> yeah if we go back to our very first video together we set it up not in a car but it was a table and we're sitting there you know i'm fully suited with a tie and she's like in a lady suit or something and and we're doing it felt like we were doing the news mm-hmm. and it was so bad and uh we spent three so and a half hours four hours doing it and we never, never used a single never clip from it. it except in a blooper reel yeah and, and then um. we, we <laughs> did it again the following week and we didn't end up using that video either so like uh-huh. it doesn't just happen you know i'm terrible like i'll do like 50 takes where rebecca could do one or two takes and she's done you know it's it just comes natural for her I need like a something to read teleprompter. Yeah. I realized, I just realized that like six months ago too, that the whole time I just needed that. And I would get through the whole thing for the most part. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's uh, it's also, you know, it's good advice. Your imperfections are your perfections. And, you know, you tried to do the whole like newsroom with suit and tie and it came off awkward and you're like, we're not even putting this out. Right. And it was more work then just flicking your dash cam on talking yeah. about something that you know a ton about and posting it <laughs> yeah. so simple but i love that so thank you so much for being on the show i really appreciate it and uh i had fun so appreciate it thank Me you too. very much thank you so much great to meet you Have likewise a good one. thank you for listening if you want to accomplish your real estate goals then i highly suggest downloading my free ultimate real estate goal setting framework The link is in the description of the show and it will help you break down your annual income goal into the amount of phone calls, appointments, or open houses you need in order to achieve that goal. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time.